Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit about MR contrast agents. Uh, okay, so uh, there's five vignettes to talk about with contrast agents, but I'm only going to talk about three of them in this lecture, and I'll talk about the last two vignettes after lunch. So I'll talk about the chemistry and physics of gadolinium-based contrast agents. I'll talk about the landscape of gadolinium-based contrast agents, and I'll talk about extracellular agents, and there's a separate lecture on gadozetate disodium and on what contrast agent to use. So we'll talk about vignettes one, two, and three. So vignette number one, the chemistry and physics of gadolinium-based contrast agents. The first thing I want to emphasize is that gadolinium is invisible on clinical MRI scanners. So shown here is a saline bag, and shown here is a little test tube, and there is a bottle of gadolinium in this image. Can anyone see the bottle of gadolinium? Well, it's right here. So there was a 20 ml syringe filled with gadolinium, and notice that you cannot see it at all. So gadolinium, pure gadolinium, is completely invisible on MRI. And the reason is that um, gadolinium shortens T1 and T2. And we already went through this before, so let me go fast here. But when you look at pure gadolinium, there's such a high concentration of gadolinium that, the echo t that you cannot see it because all the signal has decayed. So a pure solution of gadolinium has so much gadolinium in it that you cannot see it because all the signal goes away. So let me skip this in the interest of time since we did that. Uh, so with standard sequences and gadolinium concentration in most tissues, the T1 effect dominates over the T2 effect. So when we give standard concentrations of gadolinium, this is what we get. The tissues become much, much brighter on T1 weighted images. As I showed in the previous lecture, gadolinium has minimal effects on T2. The image on the left, the image on the right look very similar, even though the image on the left is pre-GAD and the image on the right is post-GAD. So on T1-weighted images, this is the difference. This is what gadolinium does for you on T1, huge differences. And this is what gadolinium does for you on T2, very little. And this is what gadolinium does for you on DWI, very little. The images on the above are with the image, I'm sorry, are without gadolinium. The images below are with gadolinium. So gadolinium, a lot of effect on T1. At clinical concentrations, uh, very little effect on T2 or DWI. Now, why gadolinium? Well, here's a periodic table. And let us focus now on gadolinium. And why is it that we want to focus on, why is it that we use gadolinium for MRI? And the reason is that gadolinium has seven unpaired electrons in its inner shell. And why do we care about that? Because each unpaired electron has a magnetic dipole moment. So at the first lecture, I mentioned that protons have a quantum mechanical property called spin. Turns out electrons also have a quantum mechanical property called spin. And because, quanta, because protons have a quantum mechanical, I'm sorry, electrons have a quantum mechanical property called spin, they have a magnetic dipole moment. So here is the magnetic dipole moment of hydrogen. Here is the magnetic dipole moment of an electron. Turns out that the, electro, uh, that the magnetic dipole moment is proportional to the charge, and electrons and protons have the same charge, but in opposite directions but it's inversely related to the size. Electrons are much smaller than protons, so they have a much larger magnetic dipole moment. In fact, an electron has a magnetic dipole moment 657 times greater than the magnetic dipole moment of proton. So gadolinium, as a contrast agent, is for each electron, it's 657 times more powerful than hydrogen, except that there's seven unpaired electrons. So whatever seven times 657 is, it's probably like 4,500. So gadolinium is about 4,500 times more powerful than hydrogen uh, proton as a contrast agent on MRI. So why is that? 
Well, it turns out that the magnetic dipole moments cause magnetic field fluctuations. So here we have this electron, and this particular electron is pointing up, but uh, within the magnetic field, but this little electron magnetic dipole moment is going to be spinning around or precessing or moving around anyway. And this movement is going to alter the magnetic field. And these magnetic field fluctuations cause relaxation. So here we have our gadolinium with our seven unpaired electrons. And we have now a bunch of water molecules so these, all these little Mickey Mouses, the, the, the big central circle is oxygen, and the little Mickey Mouse ears are hydrogens. The hydrogens are smaller than oxygen, that's why they look like little ears on Mickey Mouse. So now let's see what happens when this gadolinium with its seven unpaired electrons tumbles by the water. Notice that the Mickey Mouse ears get brighter, they relax. So gadolinium causes the T1 relaxation of protons to shorten. And in particular, it causes the T1 relaxation of water protons to shorten so that the water protons get brighter. Notice also that one gadolinium atom, right, caused multiple different water protons to relax. So it's not like one gadolinium causes one proton to relax. One gadolinium affects thousands of protons. And that's an amplification effect. In fact, per second, one gadolinium atom relaxes about one million protons per second. So it's a huge amplification. And that's fundamentally different than CT, where one iodine atom blocks one photon. So on CT, we do not have amplification. On MRI, we do have amplification. And that's why MRI is more sensitive to gadolinium then CT is to iodine. It's MRI, amplification, CT, no amplification. And just to illustrate that, here's an example of a lesion on CT. And what we're looking for is, so here's the lesion. And what we're looking for is whether there's any areas of enhancement within this lesion so that we can characterize it a little better. Difficult to characterize on CT, but then we do an MRI and notice on MRI that we do see that there's gadolinium-based contrast agent accumulating in this lesion. And over time, the accumulation increases. And this allows us, in this particular case, to make a diagnosis of a hemangioma. So for those of you who are radiologists, uh, trust me, this is a slam dunk diagnosis of a hemangioma. This is a much harder diagnosis of hemangioma on CT, because it's much harder to see the iodine on CT than it is to see the gadolinium on MRI because of the amplification effect on MRI that's not present on CT. Now there's something called relaxivity. So in the first lecture, I talked about T1 relaxation time. And I said that T1 relaxation time can also be described as an R1 rate time, R1 rate constant. Little r1 is the relaxivity. And, if, and, and the little r1, the relaxivity associated with the contrast agent, is equal to the change in the rate constant divided by the gadolinium concentration. Now, if you're not following all this, just remember this. The relaxation, uh, the relaxivity of a contrast agent is equal to the bang over the buck. So if it causes a huge change in the relaxation of water, with a very low concentration of gadolinium, so if the numerator is high or the denominator is low or both, you get large bang to the buck, high relaxivity. And in the interest of time, let me skip this and let me skip this because it's a little too confusing. So please ignore all this and just focus on this. The relaxivity of a contrast agent is the change in relaxation rate divided by the concentration. It's the bang over the buck. And how does this work? Well, here is a tissue relaxing as a function of TR. So the signal is increasing. And if we give, uh, and if we're looking at this particular TR, then that's how much signal we have. If we give gadolinium that has relatively low relaxivity, 
this is how much signal we have. And if we give a gadolinium, if we give either greater gadolinium concentration or we give a gadolinium-based agent with greater relaxivity, we relax faster. So let me repeat that, this is really important. If we give a gadolinium-based contrast agent with relatively low relaxivity, this is how much signal we expect to get. If we give a contrast agent with higher relaxivity, this is how much signal we expect to get. So the bottom line is that all other things being equal, choose a gadolinium-based contrast agent with higher relaxivity, because for the same dose of gadolinium, you're gonna go from here to here. Now, gadolinium is toxic, so it'd be nice if we could just give people gadolinium with its seven unpaired electrons, but this is quite toxic. It kills people. It will destroy your macrophages, it will destroy your cupper cells, and gadolinium will kill people. You cannot give pure gadolinium. So in order to make the gadolinium safe, we attach it to a chelator, which is a large molecule that binds to the coordination spheres of gadolinium and, and prevents the gadolinium atom from accumulating in tissues. Now notice that one of the coordination spheres is free, and this is very important because there's a little tiny uh, channel or hole in this chelator that allows water to get into here. So let me show you what I mean by that. So here's our water molecule, and notice that our hydrogen protons are not relaxed. In order for gadolinium to relax this water molecule, these protons have to come in contact or have to come very close to the gadolinium. Maybe not in contact, they have to come close. So the water has to sort of bounce into that little tiny gap. Sorry, like this. Now let's see what this is gonna look like for multiple water molecules. So here's our gadolinium. There's our uh, gadolinium, th th and this is the magnetic dipole moment associated with gadolinium. Here's our molecule surrounding the gadolinium. And now what we're gonna show is these water molecules, and now this gadolinium is gonna be vibrating, and the vibration is gonna cause magnetic field fluctuations. And these magnetic field fluctuations are gonna interact with these water molecules as they get into that area and cause the water molecule to relax. And then the next water molecule will get in there and it will relax. And the next water molecule will get in there and it will relax. And the next water molecule will get in there and it will relax. And I'm gonna do this a thousand times, so we'll be done with this in a few hours. Um, but anyway, over time, eventually all the water relaxes because they all get in there. Remember, it's one million protons per second per gadolinium on average. Now, I mentioned before that these fluctuations are really important. Uh, it's these fluctuations, it's this vibration of this magnetic dipole moment by the seven unpaired electrons that are critical to all of us. Um, but if it's vibrating too fast, it's not a good thing. So below, I have the gadolinium, and above, I have a hydrogen proton. And the hydrogen proton is precessing at the Larmor frequency. Now, what about this gadolinium? If this gadolinium is precessing too fast, the interaction between the gadolinium and the water proton and, and, the water, and the water proton is very inefficient and the relaxation is slow. If on the other hand, I can slow down the gadolinium by binding it to a macromolecule like a protein, by, by making that tumbling rate slow down so that it, slow, it actually vibrates at the same rate as the precession frequency of water, it becomes more efficient. So a small gadolinium-based contrast agent vibrates too fast to be an efficient relaxer of water. But if you can take a gadolinium-based contrast agent and slow down its tumbling rate, either by binding it to a big protein as shown here in green or by some other mechanism, it becomes a more efficient relaxer. So this chelator to which the gadolinium is attached is very important because the chelator influences whether the gadolinium-based contrast agent is excreted by the kidneys it influences whether the gadolinium-based contrast agent gets taken up by liver cells. It influences whether the gadolinium-based contrast agent binds to proteins, and you now know why binding to protein is important, because if it binds to proteins, it tumbles more slowly, and it becomes better at relaxing water, more bang for the buck, higher relaxivity. And something that I didn't discuss is that the chelator decides how stable the compound is because 
this gadolinium can in fact dissociate itself from the chelator. And what happens when gadolinium dissociates itself from the chelator? It can cause toxicity. So we want chelators, ideally we want chelators that bind very, very tightly to gadolinium so the gadolinium does not get out. We want chelators that bind to protein so that they become more efficient at causing relaxation. And sometimes we want chelators that get inside liver cells and sometimes we don't. And we'll talk about that in, the, in, a, in, a, in another lecture. Okay, so that was the chemistry and physics of gadolinium-based uh, contrast agents. Uh, quickly, the landscape of gadolinium-based contrast agents. So contrast agents in the United States can be divided into gadolinium-based contrast agents and non-gadolinium-based contrast agents. Non-gadolinium-based contrast agents include ferromoxides, which are iron-based particles, and manganotopyr, uh, which is a manganese-based contrast agent. So manganese has five, I think, unpaired electrons, not quite as good as gadolinium, but still pretty good. And here are all the gadolinium-based contrast agents that are available uh, in the United States. And what's the difference between all of these gadolinium-based contrast agents? The difference is the chelator. So this one, for example, has DTPA, and this one has HPDO3A, and this one has DTPA, BMA, et cetera. So that's what the difference is between these different gadolinium formulations. Gadolinium is gadolinium, so that doesn't change. The difference is the chelator, and the chelator might have different stability. Uh, the chelator might have different protein binding. The chelator uh, might have uh, different uh, hepatobiliary uptake. So these are all the contrast agents that are approved in the United States, but several of them have been discontinued. So although they're disapproved, I mean, although they are approved, they are no longer uh, available. And the ones that are currently available are shown here. Now, something else that you should be aware of is that contrast agents are expensive and time consuming to bring to market. So from the time a contrast agent is first discovered until the time it's brought to market, it takes about 15 years and about 200 million US dollars. So if you're wondering why there's so few contrast agents available in the United States, it's each one of these contrast agents costs $200 million. And then another thing to think about is how much money is a company gonna make from a contrast agent? Well, worldwide, therapeutic drugs account for over 99% of all drug sales. Contrast agents, fewer than 1% of all drug sales. Um, and if you think about it, how often does a human being need a contrast agent and how often does a human being need a therapeutic drug? Well, let's say you have a human being who's on, who has high blood pressure. That person needs that high blood pressure medication every single day of their life until their blood pressure goes away. But how often do you need a, a dose of gadolinium? I mean, at most once every three months, right? No one gets a dose of gadolinium every day. So drug companies don't make that many contrast agents because it's very expensive to make them and you don't make that much money off of them. Now, I'm gonna skip through this, well, just, just for your viewing pleasure or just curiosity, these are the chemical structures of the different chelators. These different chelators uh, are shown here, DTPA, DTPA, BMA, et cetera. These different chelators uh, have different uh, generic names and different commercial names as shown here. Uh, because of the different chelators, the contrast agents can fall into different classes. So there's the so-called extracellular agents here. There's the agents with low hepatobiliary uptake here. There's the agent with high hepatobiliary uptake shown here. And then there's uh, the so-called blood pool agent shown here. Now this blood pool agent is no longer available, so we'll get rid of it. Um, in the United States, or at least at UCSD, this particular agent, we don't use it as a hepatobiliary agent. We use it as an extracellular agent, so we'll put it over there. So at UCSD, we really only use either extracellular agents or gadozetate, which is an agent with high hepatobiliary uptake. We'll talk about this agent in a future lecture. So now let's just say a few words about extracellular agents. So let's talk a little bit about extracellular agents and then we'll take a break for lunch. So extracellular agents uh, and the liver uh, is going to be shown schematically over here. So we're gonna give the contrast agent and the contrast agent is gonna get pumped out into the aorta. And 
it's going to go from the aorta down the body into the spleen, into the gut, and into the liver. But the liver has a dual blood supply. So we have the hepatic artery going into the liver. But then um, we also have contrast then getting into the liver via the splenic vein and via the mesenteric circulation through the portal vein into the liver. So 25% of the contrast is going to get into the liver via the hepatic artery, and about 75% is going to get in via the portal vein, but the portal vein contrast gets in later, right? Because the portal vein contrast has to go through the spleen and through the gut to get back into the splenic vein and the mesenteric vessels. And it turns out that that takes about 10 to 15 seconds. So we're going to see contrast going down the aorta and into the hepatic artery. And then about 10 or 15 seconds later, we're going to see contrast getting into the liver via the portal vein. Now the liver enhancement is mainly going to be due to the portal vein uh, because 75% of the liver is supplied by the portal vein. Um, so put that in the back of your minds. Now something I, had, I didn't illustrate very well here is that the sinusoids and the hepatic veins enhance only after the liver enhances. So liver is going to get some contrast via the hepatic artery. 10 to 15 seconds later, it's going to get contrast via the portal vein. The contrast is going to make its way through the sinusoids. And, after, and only later is it going to make its way into the hepatic veins. So what does this look like schematically? So here we have enhancement on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. So we're going to give a contrast agent, and the hepatic artery will enhance and then de-enhance. And then if there's a tumor, the tumor is fed by the hepatic artery, and the tumor will enhance and de-enhance. And notice that it takes about 10 to 15 seconds for the tumor to enhance after the liver after the hepatic artery enhances. Now, does 10 to 15 seconds ring a bell? Remember on the previous slide, I said that the portal vein brings contrast into the liver about 10 to 15 seconds after the hepatic artery. So by coincidence, it takes 10 to 15 seconds for contrast to go from the aorta through the spleen and mesentery into the portal vein. And by coincidence, it takes the same amount of time 10 to 15 seconds for the contrast to get from the hepatic artery into a tumor. It didn't have to be that way, it just is that way. 10 to 15 seconds is the lag. Okay, so the tumor enhances 15 seconds after the artery. The portal vein, as I mentioned, also enhances 10 to 15 seconds after the artery, right? So the portal vein and the tumor start to enhance around the same time by coincidence, and the portal vein peaks and then uh, de-enhances. The liver is fed mainly by the portal vein. So the liver enhancement, although there's some liver enhancement when the, you know, immediately with the hepatic artery, most of the liver enhancement doesn't really begin until we see contrast in the portal vein in blue. And then the hepatic veins uh, drain from the sinusoid, so they enhance after the liver begins to enhance. So Hepatic artery, tumor and portal vein begin simultaneously, liver, then hepatic veins, that's the order. And the key dynamic phases are then pre-contrast, the early arterial phase, the late arterial phase, the portal venous phase, which is when the liver reaches its peak enhancement, and then the so-called delayed phase, three to five minutes, when all of these things are de-enhancing at a similar rate. Let's focus now on early arterial and late arterial. The early arterial phase is when the hepatic artery is peak, and the late arterial phase is when the tumor is peak. Let's focus now on those. So if you wanted to image a tumor, would you want to image early arterial phase, or would you want to image late arterial phase? If you want to image a tumor, I hope I can convince you that you want to image in the late arterial phase. And to illustrate that, here is a pre-contrast image, and this is early arterial phase imaging of the liver. Does anyone see the tumor? That's so easy, right? 
Now, does anyone see the tumor? Pretty obvious. Okay, so late arterial phase shows the tumor on average better than the early arterial phase. If you thought that was just one example, what about this? Who sees the tumor? Not so easy on the early arterial phase. Who sees the tumor in the late arterial phase? Pretty obvious. So late arterial phase is better than early arterial phase for tumor imaging. On the other hand, if what you're trying to image is just hepatic arteries, then the early arterial phase is great. But usually we're not trying to image hepatic arteries, usually we're trying to image tumors. Now, another question then is, how do you know when you have a good arterial phase? Well, the way you can tell is let's focus now on that late arterial phase and remind ourselves that when we have late arterial phase, we should see contrast in the portal vein. We should see maybe a little enhancement of the liver in orange, but we should see no enhancement of the hepatic veins. So you know you have a good late arterial phase when you have enhancement of the portal vein, but you don't have enhancement of the hepatic veins. If you have enhancement of the hepatic veins, you're too late. If you have no enhancement of the portal vein, you're too early. And this would be an example of a pretty good arterial phase where you see enhancement of the artery and the portal vein, but you don't see enhancement of the hepatic vein. See, this is a hepatic vein. There's no contrast in the hepatic veins. Here on the coronal reformation, hepatic vein, no contrast, hepatic vein, no contrast. So that's a good, pretty good arterial phase. Now, now you're asking, well, okay, if there's no contrast in the hepatic veins, why is there a contrast in the IVC? And the reason there's contrast in the IVC, the inferior vena cava, is because the kidneys drain into the inferior vena cava very quickly. So don't be surprised if you see contrast in the inferior vena cava. You just don't want to see contrast in the hepatic veins. And here, by the way, you see a flow artifact where the unenhanced uh, the unenhanced blood from the hepatic vein is entering the inferior vena cava, and that's causing this mixing artifact between below and above. And let's skip this in the interest of time. And let me just say that, well, let me skip this in the interest of time as well. And let me skip this in the interest of time. Okay, so what I wanted to go over uh, in this lecture was a few things. So I wanted to go over the fact that most contrast agents currently used rely on gadolinium. Gadolinium has seven unpaired electrons. Electrons are very powerful magnetic dipoles. Gadolinium has more unpaired electrons than any other atom in the periodic table. It has seven. Each electron is 657 times more powerful than hydrogen. As a contrast agent, gadolinium has seven. So gadolinium is about 4,500 times more powerful than a hydrogen as a contrast agent. That's why we use gadolinium. Gadolinium, however, is toxic. If you give people gadolinium, they will die. So we have to chelate it, and the chelator makes it safe to give. The chelator also gives the gadolinium several properties. The chelator uh, decides whether the gadolinium binds to or doesn't bind to proteins. If it binds to proteins, the gadolinium becomes better, it has higher relaxivity, more bang for the buck. All other things being equal, you want gadolinium-based contrast agents that bind to proteins, it slows down the tumbling rate, makes them more efficient. The chelator also determines whether the contrast agent does or doesn't get taken up by the liver. Uh, we'll talk in a, after lunch about a contrast agent that gets taken up by the liver. And the chelator also decides whether the contrast, uh, the stability with which the gadolinium is bound, some chelators bind gadolinium very tightly, some bind it less tightly. All other things being equal, you want a contrast agent that binds gadolinium very, very tightly so that it's safe. We then talked about how gadolinium is used for liver imaging, and we mentioned that the liver is supplied 25% by the hepatic artery, 75% by the portal vein. When you give gadolinium, it goes down the aorta, through the hepatic artery, into the liver. 10 to 15 seconds later, you get contrast going into the portal vein. Uh, tumors, when they enhance, uh, they enhance via the hepatic artery, but it takes 10 to 15 seconds for tumors to enhance. By coincidence, it takes 10 or 15 seconds for the portal vein to fill with contrast. So how do you know when you have a perfect arterial phase for tumor imaging? You want to see contrast in the portal vein, but not in the hepatic veins. If you don't see contrast in the portal vein, you're too early. If you do see contrast in the hepatic veins, you're too late. Okay.
Thank you. We'll break for lunch.